In 2004, another kind of maroon rhythm was created in inner city Kingston via the sound engineer's mixing board. The down sound label had created a new electronic maroon rhythm. And like all of its productions and recordings, this rhythm represented down sounds, quote, own brand of Jamaican musical authenticity, end quote, and was, according to Down Sound's website, ready to be exported for world consumption. But what does that mean? What does it mean to electronically generate any sound, much less a maroon rhythm, for the purpose of export or world consumption? Arguably, in different ways, the production of this rhythm raises questions about how maroon culture and history have been recorded and how maroon culture and history will survive in the face of globalization. In the interest of fleeting time, I will move quickly into the music then turn sharply to a literary example. So buckle up as this ride will be fast. We know what it means to ride a bicycle. We know what it means to ride a horse. But what does it mean to ride a rhythm? Only the best artists ride well, and they do so with undeniable socio-political acuity and verbal dexterity sometimes boastful, sometimes humble, always intending to crush the competition, the dance hall DJ becomes a rhythm jockey of sorts, moving in syncopation with the bass, hitching up on the crescendos of a chorus, yet careful to sit on upon the curve of a verse. Using the rhythm as a vehicle, the dance hall DJ or reggae artist rides over throbbing bass lines and playful electronic sounds in order to take listeners on a storytelling journey. From Bantan Moja to Jacure, quite a few popular dancehall and reggae artists rode the electronic, arguably Afrofuturist, maroon rhythm in 2004. Here now is a sampling of Sizzla's maroon rhythm ride titled Free. And I ask that you analyze his words with consideration of how his lyrics work to export a maroon experience. and mourning. Mama work hard until her fingers are numb. Trying to escape poverty, but somehow it's still numbing, numbing. Every day someone gets shot down. Corruption. That's how the system is running. Whoa. And then the chorus comes in. I got to set myself free. Whoa, ho. I gotta be free and be what the Most High had always wanted me to be, gotta be free. Set the captives free, he says. These words speak to actualizing one's own freedom from the slavery of Western bondage and speaks of setting the captives free. I'm curious as to whether or not these words that ride over a rhythm bearing the name Maroon creates confusion for a global consumer with limited knowledge of contemporary Jamaica and limited knowledge of Jamaica's history. This is especially concerning for me as Down Sound's maroon rhythm sounds more like the Rastafarian Nyabingi drumming than the faster paced rhythms that we heard in here yesterday. As a song like this on a rhythm like this one enters the global marketplace for the purpose of export and consumption, how does the maroon story survive these layers of artistic interpretation? So we change gears now. We ride over to the literature. In 2015, Jamaican author Marlon James admitted a similar interest in exporting his own brand of Jamaican authenticity via literature. Using his Facebook page as a platform, James revealed that his writing was done with the intent 
of being published. He stated that successful publications, quote, pander to the cultural tone set by white women, particularly older white female critics, end quote. While he does not admit to writing his books for white women, he has admitted that his narrative voice and narrative choices have been influenced by his awareness of the white woman reader as the figurative global audience eager for his historical fictions, his Jamaican exports, and as a well-decorated and highly awarded author, the admission of this influence is important. As a kind of Jamaican Afrofuturist text steeped in history and the gendered violence of, vi violence of slavery, Marlon James' 2009 novel, The Book of Night Women, emphasizes the mysticism that surrounds the Maroons and their power. The novel centers around the evolution, if not maturation, of a young woman who was born of rape into slavery. This woman, whom they call Lilith, is feared more for her bold black skin, bright green eyes, and sharp tongue than for the insurmountable mixed race blood that courses through her veins. Lilith is an uncommon protagonist whom readers are made to hate as much as they are made to cheer. In this novel, I find another Maroon story, told not so much through the characters as through Maroon characteristics. James' narrator, narrator explains, quote, white man couldn't beat no Maroon. They fight and they war, but Maroon could become ground, air, or bush if he wish. Green as leaf or black like midnight. 100 militia going to the hills, less than 30 coming back. The maroon trick be to get the infantry to pass through a passage so narrow that they can only go one by one. Then they pick them off, end quote. This is one of the few instances of direct maroon acknowledgement. Interestingly, the Book of Night Women abandons that more common trope of the anti-colonial maroon, choosing instead to itch up on the maroon rhythm to see how far and how deep into history's passages one can go before the ambush of violent reality becomes too much for the white woman, global consumer, for her to read, for her to bear. This novel casts the Maroons as less than supportive towards those Africans and African descendants who remained in bondage. When the enslaved men and women of the Montpellier or Calibria states speak of the Maroons, it is with resentment and dislike because of how the Maroons' freedom was predicated on the enslaved people's continued enslavement. Therefore, it can be said that Marlon James' novel avoids glorifying the Maroons of Jamaica's African as Jamaica's African heroes and instead depicts them through the eyes of the black majority who remain tethered to the plantation, fearful of death, and bound to their masters. What does this do for the Maroon rhythm? What does this do for the Maroon rhythm as it plays for the world's ears to consume? James's representation of the Maroons is not meant to evoke the typical Maroon pride in resisting European hegemony, fighting back Bakra, or fighting down Babylon's bald heads that one experiences when listening to a song like Burning Spears' Queen of the Mountain. So if time allowed, I would share another passage from James's text, where James, is, uh, James as author rides the maroon, rit maroon rhythm of guerrilla warfare and the ambush technique, but time does not allow. So, I will close with the question of purpose, and a question about what maroon story, what maroon history gets placed on the audio record or the scribal record. In a way, one might describe Afrofuturism as anti-Babylon. Anti-Babylon, that's not funny. And in a longer way, one would say that Afrofuturism is a cultural and literary aesthetic that critiques the Africans' experience throughout the diaspora with a focus on the imagined and reimagined worlds of the past, present, and future. The living history of Jamaica's maroon, maroons is the manifestation of Afrofuturism. We must take care with how this history appears and exists in the global marketplace. Space or me being here. I completed my PhD in 1978. That young lady was born about five years later, and we are sharing a stage. It was an incredible experience to share a platform with my daughter. Awesome. Honor, I say. We take it one step further as we look at the zenith of globalization. What does this do? How can the Maroons help us? Let me take you back to 2007 when Richard Watson published a very incredible book called The History of the Next 50 Years. He predicts that globalization, which will mean Americanization, 
We expose people, products, and ideas from everywhere, impacting on everyone. Everything from every country will be linked. Privacy will no longer exist. But then he predicted that a counteraction will take place. Localization will reemerge. People will now go back from whence they came in terms of their consciousness. The prediction in 2007 was that the European Union will begin to splinter. You heard me? 2007, Richard Watson said the European Union will become a new tribalism will drive city states. Polarization will begin and people will start to find multiple futures. I'm not surprised at this because long ago in my work I acknowledge that culture naturally resists oppression. The culture is what gives you a design for living the pattern for interpreting reality. Culture always resists. And the good thing about it, we are the survivors. We are the children of those who survived at every level. interaction has begun. When we talk about surviving folks, remember that we were the ones that survived the slave catchers. We survived the Middle Passage, the enslavement, colonization. We were the ones that escaped, resisted, rebelled, achieved freedom. Sankofa, a word in Tui language of Ghana means go back and get it. Go back and get it. There's a saying in Jamaica that when trouble take you, pick the shot fit you. In dark times, the eyes begin to see. It is time for us to go back and fetch. The Maroons were self-reliant in the most hostile of conditions, yet they fed themselves, they kept their people well, and they healed the sick. There's a song that has come down traditionally in Jamaica about how the whole process um, worked. It was the Maroons who catalogued and documented all the weeds, all the bush, all the herbs in terms of what they did. Three years ago, I had a condition, I had a pain in my back, it came down my arm. In about two weeks, my hand could not move, it was totally paralyzed. Of course, as a well-educated person who understands processes, I went to see my general practitioner. He referred me first to the doctor who should be able to figure these things out, the orthopedic surgeon. All right? He found nothing wrong, could not identify. So he referred me to the neurologist. Neurologist checked every single thing and then they defined it as idiopathic brachial plexus. 
in medicine, idiopathic in idiot, meaning that we don't know is what. But what it says in the journal that it, with five, between three and five years, it corrects itself. I was aware of it five years. I read the books. I eventually found in my herbal book by a maroon that a wonderful herb, vervain, was documented that have uses in that area. I do a walk in the morning in the bushes and I found vervain. I made it and in two weeks my hand was healed. It's available in the supermarkets now. So we go back and fetch it because the Maroons were able to do it in the most hostile of contexts. We can do it now. We have more to work with. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful panel. Can you guys put your hands together again? Okay, so we have time for a few questions. Anyone in the audience? Uh, yes, Sarah. Yeah, this is for Isis. Um, I really enjoyed your paper, and thank you for speaking about the complex ethics of authorship. I think we need to think more about that as literary critics, um, issues of ethics around like publication and the literary market. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about James's style. Um, you talk about the violence in the book, the represented violence as sort of impediment to um, white women consuming the book. Do you think of the style in a similar way? Can you say something about that? Well, I don't think it's an impediment to their um, ability, to white women's ability to approach the text. I, the way I read it is that he's adopting maroon tactics. And so he's creating passages in the same way that Maroons would create these narrow passages or passageways where, you know, single file, the, um, the white men had to walk, the soldiers had to walk through and then they would be picked off. I find that the narrow passages or the ways of the passages, the literary passages kind of close in on the reader, um, function in that same kind of way. And it's an ambush, right? So the, the words become the, the, the bullets in a sense, right? And so this kind of, um, inundation of violence against the body um, works in that kind of way. So it's an, it's an ambush strategy or it's, it's the, the aesthetics of ambush that are, are kind of appropriated by James um, in, the, in the writing. I would also be interested to see like in your account of the market like to what extent do like white women like act as the main purchasers of books too. I think that's important to think about. Definitely, definitely. So I mean it's part of a larger project and all of that has to be taken into consideration, yeah. certainly. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, moon illness, one moon illness says the moons came here as mercenaries, healers and breeders. With a, an unquenchable thirst for freedom. Seems to be any relationship in your study that we can confirm that this could be so. Is there one particular person you want to address that to? General. General? Okay. Anyone who wants to? Um, uh, one, one thing I'd say, I mean, in, in terms of thinking about sound, which might embody the, this maroon thirst, which you talked about, is basically is a, is a term that, in fact, a poet T.S. Eliot from a different European culture came up. He talked about the auditory imagination. And this is, I think, uh, I talk about the sonic imagination, being able to use sound, as, as, you, as my um, colleague panelists have been um, pointing out, to use sound to be able to imagine different futures. And that imagining very often comes from a position not of comfort, but of discomfort, even of pain, right? And so the, the, if you like, the challenge, the struggle of survival, right, in, with, I mean, using the medium of sound can allow possibly for um, a strengthening of that struggle through being able to imagine ourselves in different places, in a, in a, in a better future, in a, in a place of betterment. So that might be one answer. The question about healers. There's no question that the Maroons did some serious documentation in terms of what Jamaica, what exists here, 
in terms of the healing properties. We haven't even scratched the surface. And my fear is that we may lose this knowledge. It's one good thing for us to talk about the Maroons as a historical, as what happened then. But if we don't capture that knowledge and package it and fine tune it and use it, and guess what, we'll have to. Because Big Pharma doesn't really love us. They go find a way to charge us more and more. And if they can actually find it before we document it, guess what they're going to do? Take it and try and sell it back to us. So we rather find a way to use it. So that element, the healing art, arts that they mastered, we have to make sure that we make sure that we capture all of that and put it to work. Yeah, and to, to piggyback on that, is if you're looking and thinking about healing um, from a musical perspective, as I've been um, thinking about it, that then you see this event itself as an indication and um, demonstrative of that process of healing, of the process of understanding the need to reinforce identities, to reinforce the histories that, as you um, just said, that are in danger of just slipping away. Um, if people like Colonel Lumsden, if people like um, uh, Kim don't step up and have not stepped up, that process is hastened even, even more. So, um, yeah, to, to, to speak to that. Thank you. So we had a multi-generational panel here. We had rain and technology. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, if you have any further questions, I'm sure the panelists are happy to talk to you in person. Thank you all.